So Parshas Vayetze continues, and Yaakov has struck a deal. He is going to work for Lavan for seven years. And after that, he's going to marry Rachel. Lavan says, all right, fine. I better give it to you than somebody else. So Yaakov works for seven years in order to marry Rachel. And at the end of these seven years, he says, okay, give me my wife. Why does he speak like that? So Rashi explains to us that, first of all, his mother only allowed him a certain amount of time to be away from home. Yaakov is still a good boy, even though he's already 84 years old. His mother said he has to come home. He still <laughs> listens. He's got to come home, right? And uh, besides this, Yaakov is no young man, 84 years old, and his, his uh, demands were entirely innocent. He's got he's to father children. And so Lovan says, no problem, fine, fine. He gathers all the local people, and he makes this great big wedding feast. Of course, it's a Jewish wedding. Rivka was veiled when she met the Yitzchak, and Leah is veiled when she is led under the chuppah. Presumably, he thinks he's marrying Rachel, but that's not what happens. And then morning came. The morning came, and suddenly, it's not Rachel. Suddenly, it's Leah. Let's take a look in the Chumash, chapter 29, verse 25. Vayehi vaboiker, morning dawned. Vehine hi Leah. It's Leah. It's not Rachel. Vayemer Lavan. Vayemer he tells right away, running to Lavan. He says, Ma zeis asi soli. What have you done to me? Haloi the Rachel of vadati imach. I worked for Rachel with you. Vloma rimisani. And why have you deceived me? So vayehi, interestingly is called Lashon Tsar. There's different languages, different expressions in the Hebrew language. Vahoya is when we're introducing something joyous. Vayehi is when we're going into a situation of discomfort. Tsar means being squeezed into a narrow place. The most famous book, perhaps, that begins with the words Vayehi is the book of Esther. Vayehi bimeach hashverosh. It's not heralding good news. You're going to have genocide planned against the Jewish people. So this is the morning after a wedding, and it's a vayehi. So the Urachayim says, yes, it is a vayehi. Because Yaakov felt very, very bad about what happened with Rachel. He felt Rachel's pain. So there was a vayehi. Vehinehi Leah. And in the morning, suddenly it's Leah. What do you mean in the morning it was Leah? It would have to have been Leah the night before too. Why does the Torah use that expression? So Rashi says that this sounds like a novelty, as if something switched. Somehow, in the morning, it was transposed into Leah. Aval balayla, but at night, says Rashi, loy haisa Leah. It wasn't Leah. It wasn't Leah? Of course it was Leah. So the thing is, Yaakov didn't know it was Leah. And that's Lafisha Mosar Yaakov Simonim. Because there were unique signs that had been developed between Yaakov and Rachel. And those signs were supposed to tell Yaakov that it's actually Rachel. And she gave the signs. Well, how did the Alea end up with the secret signs? So Rashi tells us, When Rachel saw suddenly that the wedding dress is getting put on her sister and that everything is being turned the other way around, when Rachel saw this, Amra, she said, Now my sister will be publicly shamed and embarrassed. Yaakov will stand under a chuppah and he'll make the sign and wait for a sign and it will be a disaster. <coughs> so Rachel got up and she said, I cannot see my sister shamed and embarrassed and she gave her the signs. And this is how the Gemara in Megillah on page 13 explains, which, which on the surface doesn't make sense. It was always Leah. But this is the point of how Yaakov was deceived and didn't know. Now it, it should be... Um, pointed out that because of Yaakov's modesty and because Yaakov didn't spend that much time dating Rachel as you would imagine. He was a very modest person. And this was not the... Uh, they didn't spend an enormous amount of time together. So Yaakov knew Rachel to some degree. And also they were twins and very possibly identical twins with the difference being swollen eyes or not. So Leah sounded much like Rachel and apparently there wasn't much pillow talk. So as a result of all of this, Yaakov, and she knew the signs, so she knew the signs, it, se it seemed like the real thing. 
And then all of a sudden he finds out it's not. Yaakov says to Lavan, What have you done to me? What have you done to me? I worked for Rachel. So there's two elements here. What have you done? And then what's, what's the redundancy? What's the two things? What's the mazais and what's the lama rimisani? So the Urachaim says like this. Firstly, this whole thing was an act of grand deception. You were never direct with me. You never straight with me. Now I ask you what's happening. And you tell me a story about a minog and the right, right thing. Why don't you tell me that to begin with? That's number one. Number two, he says, what kind of person are you? How do you think your daughter feels? When this whole thing was arranged in an underhand way, you kind of, you kind of shoved your daughter into a situation? It's, 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 it's not decent. In other words, Yaakov says, it's not decent to me. It's not decent to your own daughter. So there's two things here. Maza says, what would you do to your daughter? Who does this? What kind of father does this? And why did you deceive me? So what does Lovan do? <laughs> He's got a ready answer. He doesn't bat an eyelash. But Yehima Lovan, Lovan says, well, you know, I'm a very from a fellow. We don't do this like that in our place. We don't give the younger daughter in the, over into marriage before the older daughter into marriage. So what did you expect? I got to do what, what's customary. I follow customs and conventions. I'm not, uh, I don't break the law. I don't do things which is unacceptable. Now, here's the interesting question. So was this actually the minic? Or did Lovan make up a minic because it was convenient for him now? And if he made up a minig, what kind of answer would that be? Yaakov would say, what are you talking about? There's no such minig. You just created that overnight because it, was, it, it serves your purposes. But Yaakov doesn't say that. He doesn't say to Lovan, I'm calling you out. You just made that up. It doesn't, doesn't respond, actually. All you hear about here is that Lovan says to, to Yaakov, okay, let's get this week over with. You'll marry the second sister as well. But Yaakov doesn't argue. And this is the question. Why doesn't he argue? Why doesn't he say, that's ridiculous. Why did you do this? He comes to him with complaints in verse 25. And yet after verse 26, he suddenly quieted down. So let's take a look. The Rebbe actually talked about this one. He says something very interesting. And then we'll go back to the Chumash and back to the Biyurei Chumash. On page Samach Aleph, Rebbe uh, talks about this idea of love and suggesting that this was the custom. And he asked, if indeed that was the custom, so how, what did Yaakov think? He was going to be able to flout the custom? If that's the custom, that's the custom. Once upon a time, people took customs very seriously. The way they lived their lives, that's the way they lived their lives. If this is the convention in that part of the world, well, then that's the way it has to be. Kate said, Choshav Yaakov Atzmai, Lasse Sisrach Lefnei Leia, how and what was Yaakov thinking when he wanted to marry Rachel before Leah? Did he not know what the custom is? Did he not know? He was not a child. He's 84 years old. Man of the world. He's well learned. He has experiences. So the Rebbe says the answer is actually something that we learned about yesterday. And this is a quote. Since everybody was saying, we learned this Rashi yesterday. Rivka. Rivka's got two sons. Lovan's got two daughters. Perfect. First cousins. It's a match. Identical twins. Slightly different. The, the older girl will marry the older boy. The younger girl will marry the younger boy. So Savar Yankov, since Yankov Vino said, it's already preordained. Everybody's been talking about this already. <laughs> the Shidduch, the match is already cast. So Yankov thought, in Pegam, Bekachshi Yisrael Rachel. There's no problem if he marries Rachel of Nein Sur Leah. Sharei Leah Kvar Miyuedes Vei Medes Avur Esav. Leah's got a Shidduch already. She's supposed to marry Esav. Never mind, she doesn't like the Shidduch. And she cries all day about her, about her lot. But, but that's where it's going. That was the custom of the time. Akach Heshev Lovan. Lovan's response was, Layasa came bim kemenu lose satsira. You're right, you're right. She might have had a shidduch, but we don't do it in practice. In other words, just because there's a shidduch made, and just because they're going to get married, or she is already engaged, we still wouldn't have the wedding. Lose means to actually give over into marriage. Lefnea Bechira. 
Hanog bim koimenu. The custom here is shagam bin nesuyim atzmam. Not only with regard to the match or the commitment, but here also with the marriage itself. Nesina sa isha lebaila bapoil. The giving over into marriage, in actuality, yet lesh lahaktem es abchira. We always would have the older one going first. For lachain therefore, in dai bekach. It's not enough. That Leah is already married, so to speak, to another person, or at least destined to marry another person. Her marriage also has to be. And so Lavan said, Look, I saw you wanted to marry Rachel. I, I, can't, I don't know how to get all day, so I don't have his email address. He doesn't answer my calls. So we had to move forward. And if you want to marry Rachel, no problem. First, you got to marry Leah. And so Yaakov finds out that he had to marry Leah first. So um, what happens? What happens is, Lovin says, no problem. You get your wish too. Don't you worry. You get t- it's going to be twice as good. Let's fill this week, or this group of seven. We'll talk about that in a minute. And you can marry this one too. And all this will be Don't you think you're getting two for the price of one? Oh, no, 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 no. Payment is payment. You will marry Rachel. However, now you're indentured. Now you got a commitment for another seven years. And brilliant, deceptive, cunning, criminal Lavan just figured out how to get free labor, not just for seven years, but now he got another seven years. So he's got 14 years of exceptionally skilled labor, Yaakov, on the workforce. Yaakov has no choice. He thinks to himself, Salimi, I agree to this. I should have known better. And verse 28 tells us that's exactly what happened. He filled this set of seven and he got the hand of Rachel in marriage as well. So what, 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 what is this Shavua? According to most opinions, Shavua Zeis is talking about a week. It's a week. But there is another opinion and this is the notion that it wasn't just the, the, seven, the seven days, but actually we're talking here about seven full years. Malish of Ozeis means you'll fill another seven years, and then we'll be able to discuss how things move forward. But it, it seems pretty clear according to most opinions, and Rashi is very explicit about this, that Shavu Ozeis means, Rashi says, Miyad, immediately. La'achar, shivas yimeha mishta, after the seven days of feasting, so then, well, then you work another seven years. But the delay here is a week delay, not a seven-year delay. And let's go back to the Burim here, something very, very interesting. Lessons we can learn from antiquity. First of all, you should know as a, as a rule that older siblings are supposed to get married before younger siblings. And there are sometimes exceptions. So what do you do? Ask permission. Ask permission. Ask mechila. And actually it's supposed to be a written mechila. Has to be a written, a written, a written document to, to each other. The younger sibling should receive permission from the older sibling to get married before. But ideally, the custom is in the Torah community that older siblings will get married before the younger siblings. Now, this is generally speaking, assuming that they're all boys, we're all girls. But it's customary, at least in the Torah community, where girls get married at a younger age. So therefore, it's not necessarily a, a given that it has to be that way. But as a rule. There's this business, especially if they're the same gender, that the older will not get married after the younger. And, and if that's the case, so then they'll ask for Mechila, but that's something we learn from the story with Yaakov and Rachel and Leah. But it gets even more interesting. Here's another fascinating lesson that we learn from antiquity. Let's go to page Samach Beis. The Rebbe here shares a quote from Halacha, from the Rambam in Hilchas Ishus, in the laws of matrimony, in the 10th chapter, in the 14th halacha, it says this, Male So Rambam says, Afilu even during the intermediate days of Yom Tov. These are the intermediate days of Pesach, between the first holiday of Pesach and the last Yom Tov of Pesach, the first holiday of Sukkot and Shemini Atzeret, which is called Chol HaMoed. It's a weekday which is punctuated with an energy that's festive. Ein Noisim Nashim. We don't get married. No matrimony. Why is this? Lefi, because she'ein ma'arvin simcha b'simcha. 
The custom is we do not mix one joy with another. Each joy is what we call proverbially koivea bracha la'atzmai. Gets its own blessing, if you will. Has its own time. So when you're focusing on one, if you're celebrating Sukkot, you're celebrating Sukkot. You're not celebrating a marriage. If you're celebrating Pesach, then you're celebrating Pesach. That's what Jews do. Now, it doesn't mean you can't have a bar mitzvah or a bas mitzvah. Obviously, a brit milah gets made whenever it has to get made. But that's not really a, a, a real yomtif. A wedding is really a yomtif. A wedding is a real simcha. And it's a big deal. Weddings are the biggest deal for us. So big deals like weddings, this is something that would not take place on a day which is already ordained in the code of Jewish law as a simcha because ein ma'arven, we don't confuse, we don't mix, we don't try to, throw, so to speak, uh, overweigh or, or, or eclipse the simcha. One joy with the energy of another. And that's, that's learned from the story of Lovin and Yaakov. We learn it because it says, Male Shavuaza is filled this week. Let's have a week of festivities, the week of Sheva Brachas. And when the week of festivities is over, so then, Venitna Lacha Gamazes. And this is actually the halacha, when it's a, 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 a young marriage, people have never been married before, that it's not a day of celebration. It's not three days of celebration. It's a week of celebration. And actually, you're supposed to have celebratory events every single night. That's called Sheva Brachas. Sheva Brachas, seven blessings over the course of seven days. That's what the Rambam says. So the Mepharshim are very disturbed by this. What's the problem? The problem is, how do we learn a halacha from the marriage of Yaakov? Harei kayim klal, there is a rule. Ein lameidim mikoidim matan We cannot learn halacha from what happened prior to the Torah's being given. What happened before the Torah was given, happened. We became a nation, formally inducted into our role as Jewish people at Har Sinai. We're born as a nation when we leave Mitzrayim. Pesach celebrates our nationhood. And Matan Torah celebrates our calling, our mandate of being who we are as Jewish people. So you can't learn halachas from what happened prior to Matan Torah. You can only learn halachas from the way the Torah was given. And this is the answer that many people have about patrilineal descent or matrilineal descent, which seems to be an issue of emphasis on the father, where y- Yitzchak is a father, and how does Rivka become Jewish? Okay, so the answer will say that there was a gear, that she converted to Judaism, she becomes fully Jewish. But it doesn't say this openly. And there seems to be an emphasis on the nation-building origins of the Jewish people, where Avram and Yitzchak, they have a child, his name is Av- Avram and, and Sarah have a child, his name is Yitzchak. And then Yitzchak and Rivka have a child that his name is Yaakov. What's the answer? Ein lameidim halacha mikaidim atan teira. Hashem gave us a Torah at Har Sinai 3,330 years ago. What did he tell us? He says, if your mother's Jewish, you're Jewish. If your mother's not Jewish, you're not Jewish. Full stop. That's how it goes. So ein lameidim halacha. We cannot take a look at halacha. and say, you know, Moshe Rabbeinu's father married his aunt. That's true. Ein lameidim halacha. We can't learn halacha. That's how it was before matan teira. How did Yaakov marry two sisters? It's prohibited. You're not allowed to marry two sisters. Excellent question. So firstly, Ein Lameidim Halacha. Yeah, but Yaakov kept the whole Torah. Very good. There are numerous answers to how Yaakov did this. One of the most beautiful, in my humble opinion, is the Rebbe gives us this answer that's so elegant because it's so simple. The Rebbe says Yaakov is obligated to keep seven Noahide laws at the time. There's no obligation. Torah mitzvahs is an elective. That's... That's Yaakov and the Shvatim and his father and grandfather and mother and grandmother electing to follow what the Torah says. What Avram is eating matzah. Did he have to eat matzah? There was no Yitzhiyam in Mitzrayim. There was no slavery in Egypt. There were no Jewish people yet. Why is he eating matzah? Even Lot, the secular lost Jew, is also eating matzah. Why is he eating matzah for? It's an elective. It's something he chose to do. Now one of the laws of the seven Noachite laws is dinim. Dinim, which means justice. And the detail of justice is when you make your, your promise, your word is your bond. You gave a commitment, you have to honor it. Yaakov has no choice. He made a commitment to Leah, to Rachel. Now he married Leah. No fault of his. So what's he going to tell Rachel? Sorry, I made a commitment, but you know, I can't honor it. Why can't you honor it? Well, because I am very from, you know. I have a stringency and I like to keep halacha. And Leah, would, Rachel would say, but, but, but you made a commitment. And he would say, yeah, I know, but I'm, I'm very from. And that wouldn't be right. 
because the commitment is, ob- is, is obligatory. And the fact that he goes the extra mile, okay, that's his choice to go an extra mile. At any rate, what you can see is that we cannot impose the strictures of halacha on prior to Matan Torah. So why is, it not, why is a commitment an obligation of, uh, but other Torah things were not committed? So I told you the seven Noahide laws was applicable right away. And honoring commitments is part of the seven Noahide laws. But this, this makes a giant question mark on the statement that the Rambam makes. The Rambam is telling us in halacha, you cannot get married for a week, says Lavan. Why? We're in the middle of Sheva Brachas. You can't, you can't. We're in the middle of a Simcha now. And from this we learn, even in Chol HaMoed, you can't get married. So the Mepharshim say, what do you mean? The Ma'ar upon him in the Yushalmi says, this doesn't make sense. This is halacha before Matan Torah. How could halacha before Matan Torah inform, guide, and instruct that behavior after Matan Torah? The Rebbe says, just to thicken the pot, think about this. There's the Pirkei the Rebbe Lezer, the teachings, the, the um, Midrashic and Halachic teachings of Rebbe Lezer, which have their own special compilation. And over there, there's a statement. And this is a quote. Minayim anulameidim. How do we know that there's something called Sheva Brachas? That the Shiva, Yumeha Mishta, the seven days of celebration when you have young people getting married. How do you know that? Where did it come from? Who ordained it? What is the origin? What's the source? And the Pirkei Rebbe Lezer says, what do you mean? We learn it, me Yaakov Avinu. It doesn't say it about Yitzchak and Rivka's wedding, but we do see it about Yaakov's wedding. Kishanasa Leah, when he married Leah, Asa Shiva Simeh Hamishta. He did the seven days of feasting. Shanema, as it says, Male Shavu So it says it clearly. Do this week. Vahuva Bepaskim. And this is brought down in the Rambam and the Shulchan Aruch. Angel Drasha Gemura. It's not like we learn it directly from there. Because we can't learn from what was before Matan Torah. And therefore, Shivas, Yemeha Mishta, the seven days of feasting, are not actually biblical. They are of rabbinic ordination. Who ordained it? Which rabbi? So the Medrash says, Chachamim Mesha. The Medrash says that it was the sages in the generation of Mesha. The Rambam says, Mesha Tikin. This is a famous question. How could the Rambam say Moshe ordained it? That's not what it says in our, in our sources. It says the sages in the time of Moshe. And the Kesef Mishnah answers. He says, it's impossible that Moshe Rabbeinu's time, there would have been sages who did something without the direct commitment and involvement of Moshe Rabbeinu. It's impossible to conceive. So ultimately, what's the difference? It was the sages. It was in the time of Moshe. It's like Moshe did it. The point is, we're learning that it's rabbinic. What do you mean it's rabbinic? It's biblical. It's right here. You hear about a Shavuot Zeis, you hear about this week. He said, no. That doesn't make it biblical. You can't learn a halacha from what happened before Matan Teda. So this becomes the question, then how can we have a halacha that says you can't get married during the week of festivities? Because Arvin Simcha Simcha, we don't mix one joy with another. Ein Lumedim. We can't learn a halacha. It's before Matan Teda. So the Rebbe gives a fascinating solution to this vexing problem. The Yesh Leimer. The Rebbe suggests that the klau, the rule, and it is a rule, of Ein Lameidim Lefnei Matan Torah. We cannot learn or derive lessons from prior to Matan Torah who be in Yone Halacha. That's with regard to rulings. You can't make a ruling based on what they did. A binding ruling is only after Matan Torah, not before. And the reason is, Mikivan She, quote, Nitna Torah v'nischat shahalacha. It's a Gemara in Bava Basra. It says, Torah gets given, halacha gets refreshed. It's a new halacha. Torah was given, new halacha. So now we understand that E.F. Shalil made mehahalacha we cannot look at a halacha, a ruling, what they did before Matan Torah and say, oh, that's what they did, that's what we must do today. What can we look at then? What lessons can we learn from antiquity? If we can't learn halacha, what could we learn? We can learn how things are supposed to be. We can have an understanding of what's appropriate behavior. In other words, what's called in Hebrew, birur hametzias. 
we could get clarity as to how things are supposed to look. That's what we're talking about here. Nitan Lilme, this could be learned Gamlufnei Matan Torah, before Matan Torah as well. So we're going to take a look at reality and say, okay, let me understand the, this, the, the joy of a wedding. How intense is it? Is it a one-day thing? Is it a two-day thing? From a Torah perspective, how joyous is actually a new wedding, young couple getting married to build a life? How joyous actually is that? What's the answer? The answer is we can learn the nature of what a wedding is and the kind of joy that punctuates the times before and around it from what happened before Matan Torah. Before Matan Torah can give us an understanding of what something is. can't tell us what the halacha is, but it can tell us a Torah perspective. It can give us an idea of how we should view it. Rabbi, the Torah was given and it went back to the beginning. The Torah narrates the stories from the beginning of history. That's correct. So, but in doing so, the Torah conveys to us what life is supposed to look like or what life is not supposed to look like. It doesn't tell us halachas, but it tells us about the nature of the Torah perspective on life. I'll give you an example. You should know that it's beyond a shadow of a doubt that a nudist colony is a violation of Torah. Beyond a shadow of a doubt. How do we know this? Where in the Torah does it say that? The answer is in the very beginning when Adam and Chava eat from that forbidden fruit, What's the first thing they discover? That they're naked. And what's the first thing God does for them? He makes them clothing. What does this tell us? It tells us that clothing and human beings are like french fries and ketchup. They just go together. You don't have, your doggy doesn't have to have a sweater. I know it's a big business today. People are selling doggy sweaters and doggy and poodle hats and, and boots and whatever else. So they could walk in the snow. That's just a good industry. It's a way to make money off people. But the notion of animals getting dressed up is incongruous. It's no, it's no such thing. But people, people get dressed. That's, when did that start? Hmm, about 5,780 years ago. That's not a plus. There's no room. And actually, there is a halacha of tzniyas and how we're supposed to dress and, and, and that we're not supposed to flaunt our flesh. And there, there is halachas like that anyway. But the point I'm trying to make to you is we, could, we can see from the Torah what's considered to be appropriate behavior and inappropriate behavior. Before the eating of the forbidden fruit, nudity was nudity. It meant nothing. You say, look at that nude horse. Nobody says that. The dog is nude. No, dogs are not nude. People could be nude. Where do we get that from? We get The Torah tells us about what life's supposed to look like. What's a marriage supposed to look like? A marriage is a big deal. How big a deal? A weak big deal. That's, that's how big the festivities are. And that's something we can learn about from before Matan Torah. You know what else we can learn before Matan Torah? When you're in the middle of one simcha, don't mix it with another one. Focus on one simcha at a time. Because compounding the simchas or trying to layer them does not add in joy, but actually distracts from one another. They end up contradicting one another. And that's not appropriate. This is the Sheva Brachas, go for it. This, is the, this should be fully, fully celebrated. Then that finishes, move on to the next celebration. But to try to pile celebrations one on top of the other, is not only not multiplying the celebration, but in fact, subtracting and diminishing it. And that can be learned from before Matan Teda. Those are some lessons we can learn from antiquity.